Good afternoon and welcome to This Week in Turkey. Days before the March 31st local elections, the Turkish lira tumbled by nearly 5% against the dollar on Wednesday. The loss in value, however, was met by a surprise move by the central bank, resulting in a record surge in swap rates, which jumped to 1,200% in the London market. The recent fluctuations in the Turkish central bank's reserves are driven by ordinary transactions and periodic factors, the bank said in a statement on Monday. There are no unforeseen incidences, the statement added. In its statement, the Turkish central bank also vowed to closely monitor fluctuations and unhealthy price formations in financial markets and to use all monetary policy and liquidity management instruments to maintain price stability and support financial stability if deemed necessary. The central bank is decisive about its policy towards reinforcing its reserves, the statement added. According to data from the central bank, Turkey's current account shortfall shrank 88% in the first month of this year to $813 million. The deficit was $7 billion in the same month of 2018. Meanwhile, Turkey's banking regulator and capital markets watchdog have launched separate investigations into banks and JP Morgan following volatility in Turkish markets. We have received complaints that some banks led clients to buy foreign currencies in a manipulative and misleading way. Our agency has launched an investigation and a probe, and the necessary administrative and judicial processes will be conducted. The Banking Regulation and Supervision Agency, BDDK, said in a statement last Saturday. The BDDK, however, did not name those banks mentioned in the statement. In separate announcements, the BDDK and the Capital Markets Board also said that they have launched investigations into JP Morgan over a report issued by the investment bank last Friday. The watchdog said they have received complaints that the report in question hurt the reputation of Turkish banks and led to volatility in financial markets. JP Morgan's report had misleading and manipulative content, the authorities added. Meanwhile, Turkish banks have started providing lira to the London swap market, an official said on Thursday, a day after banks were told to withhold lira liquidity from the key foreign market until Sunday's local elections. On Wednesday, the London overnight swap rate surged as high as 1,200% in what was a stopgap measure to bolster the lira. That was by far its highest on the record. The same rates, however, fell as low as 50% yesterday. The main stock exchange index, BIST 100, was dropped 3.5% last Friday, with the banking index falling 6.5%. The Turkish lira's value decreased more than 4% against the dollar, hitting as high as 5.84 and closing at 5.76. In addition, Turkey's unemployment rate was 11%, up 0.1 percentage point in 2018 versus the previous year, data from the Turkish Statistics Institute showed on Monday. Joining us this afternoon is Murat Saman, who is an economist and a lecturer at Bill University. And we'll be talking about the recent fluctuations in the central bank's reserves, as well as the impact of Sunday's vote on the economy. Good afternoon, Mr. Saman. Welcome to This Week in Turkey. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the average Turkish news reader with limited financial literacy found themselves uh, having to understand what swap rates meant and whatever was going on in the London market uh, on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, people were also curious to find out what kind of, what sort of an impact this would have on the value of the Turkish Lira. First of all, could you explain for our viewers what exactly happened? Of course, the, the last week it was a lot of volatility in the market. And uh, I think the last four or five days, everybody in Turkey are talking about uh, swap rates. Uh, maybe two, three weeks ago, we were talking about the price of fruit and vegetables. But now the swap rate, it's, uh, it's something that maybe average uh, Turkish citizenship knew, know now. Uh, swap rates, I think it was last Friday. Uh, the Turkish Shira uh, went from 5.4 to 5.85 on uh, Friday evening. And uh, what happened at the beginning of this week, 
in London, the swap rate went from around 25% to 1,200% this week. Means that if you would now want to go to buy some Turkish do some dollars against Turkish lira, you have to need the Turkish lira. If you if you doesn't have the Turkish lira, you have to swap uh, or borrow from London market. But what happened? Uh, the Turkish lira market were squeezed, and uh, the interest rates uh, went to a very high level that. Nobody can uh, borrow the Turkish lira and try to buy uh, the dollars. It means that the dollar went from 5.85 to 5.3. Now it's around 5.65. And uh, Mr. Salman, what consequences do you think um, these um, recent fluctuations will have in the near future, in your opinion, not only on the Turkish lira, but on the economy as a whole? Yeah, for the economy, uh, there was two, three negative things happened in the short term. Uh, the interest rate, the, the Turkish uh, bond rate, the two years bond rate went from around 18 to 22, 23 percent, like four or five point increase means uh, now the government has to pay uh, more interest rate to borrow. Uh, the, the second one was a, a downside trend for the stock exchange, like almost 7-8% decrease of the stock exchange, uh, less value for Turkish companies. And also we have the CDS rate, it went from uh, 350 to around 440, uh, which is a, a, a risk increase uh, relative to the world market. Talking about the economy, all this depends on the election, what's going to happen on the election and what measures will be taken after the election. Uh, we all know that we Turkey needs very important structural reforms, especially for the economy. I think uh, the finance minister, Berat Albayrak, said yesterday in a TV interview that uh, 8th of April uh, they will announce some important measure about the economy. I think all the market will uh, will wait for that. Um, Mr. Salman, certain analysts, and uh, if I am to name one, I'll name uh, the Guardian's Larry Elliott, uh, the economics editor of the of the newspaper. Elliott argues that the ongoing turmoil in the Turkish economy could spark a global recession, just like it happened in 2008 and 9. What do you think? Is this an exaggeration, or would you be uh, agreeing with this kind of an analysis? Um, Turkey is a very important emerging market. We know that. And also, uh, it happened in the past that you, the Russian market or uh, what happened in Thailand uh, they all spread in all the emerging market, but I think it's too early to say that because what happening in Turkey could uh, lead to a global recession in an emerging market. I don't. I think it's too early to say. Uh, we know that all uh, things uh, were done because of the election, and uh, now after the election, we know that we have a period of four and a half years without election, which is, you know, important period to make some important reforms about the economy. I think it's too early to say that that is going to spread to a global uh, recession. Uh, finally, Mr. Salman, what do you think awaits the Turkish economy after Sunday's vote? It's a critical uh, election, even though it's a local one. So how do you see the general picture? I think in the economy, nothing will happen after Sunday. You know, it will be the same economy in the same country. And I think the same problems. Uh, Turkey has a very high inflation. Uh, okay, it went down from uh, 25 to 20, almost 20, less than 20. But we have to remember that last year the inflation rate was around 10 percent, means it's double uh, this year. Secondly, uh, we have uh, a recession now. Uh, the last quarter, uh, the the Turkish economy decreased, and uh, we expect a contraction uh, the first quarter of 2019. 
and maybe the second quarter of 2019. Uh, this is a problem because with a high inflation and uh, an economy is uh, decreasing, it's not very easy to, to make some uh, economy policies. It means that we have to lower the inflation first and uh, maybe after two, three quarters, uh, with inflation going down, lower interest rates, and maybe get again the economy growing. But it will take time, I think. It's, it's not easy. It's not, it's not like the financial markets. Like, uh, in two, three days, you can have uh, the, the currency level who can change. But the Turkish economy, uh, I think it will take time to recover and expect minimum two or three quarters to get back. Thank you very much, Mr. Salman, for your comments and for being with us today. Have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. We'll continue with our next news video now. Bekir Erdur, the head of Konda Research and Consultancy, gave an exclusive interview to Mediascope this week, only days before Sunday's critical elections. In Turkey, polarization is still the main feature of politics. People still squeeze into different identities. These parameters are still valid and they're strong. It's for this reason that we're not talking about the chances of an opposition party getting 40 or 45 percent in spite of a political power that has governed nationally for 16 years and locally for 25 years. And in spite of all the mistakes they have made within this time frame, this isn't even a chance. Nobody is debating whether the CHP will reach 38 percent. There is not even an expectation as such because polarization is still in force. But on the other hand, a very severe economic turmoil has been in place since August. On one hand, foreign policy is shattered as a result of regional and global crises, some of which directly concern us. Therefore, it is not possible that none of this will have an impact on the voter. Economic fault lines have also become activated. Cultural fault lines, meanwhile, also exist and polarization between different cultural identities continues at full steam. For this reason, what we're talking about here is a movement confined to three or five percentage points overall. But this seemingly tiny movement produces an enormous political result, which is the fact that the ruling bloc, after a very long time, is faced with the risk of losing the 51% majority and falling within the 49%. And now we're joined by Edgar Shar in the studio, who works at Mediascope, but is also a political scientist. Welcome, Edgar. Good to have you here again. Thank you, Aida. So, um, we're facing a critical local election on Sunday, as you know. Uh, this is a local one, not a national one, but the atmosphere that um, surrounds the vote seems like it's a very critical national one. So. Uh, what exactly is going on here? Why do you think that um, the, the atmosphere is so tense at this moment? Well, even, uh, even if it were a general election, uh, it shouldn't have been so tense, actually. But yeah, given Turkish political culture, we take it as normal right now. Well, I don't uh, find it surprising that it's so tense, uh, given the uh, political culture in Turkey, where um, we observe a high voter mobility, actually. Traditionally, Turkish voters move very easily, especially in the time of economic crisis. Voters tend to uh, move to other parties, and this is exactly what um, today's government uh, is frightened of. And their strategy is to polarize the society by creating us and them camps, by criminalizing the opposition, by claiming that they, are, they have some links to terrorist organizations, even by claiming that their lists are prepared uh, by the terrorist organizations. And this is how they expect to consolidate their base, actually, and to stop uh, the mobilization, the, the movement of their voter. And this, that's why it's so tense, actually. So speaking of uh, consolidating different party bases and also polarization as a um, major theme mm -hmm. and the us versus them um, rhetoric. One important point perhaps um, at this point uh, to point out is the fact that President Erdogan, along with um, his uh, partner in the alliance, mm -hmm. the um, 
the Jumhur Ittifakı, along with the MHP leader Bahçeli. Yes. Uh, he has built his entire election campaign over the question of survival, the mm. survival of the state, yes. Beka meselesi, as it's put yes. in Turkish, as our Turkish-speaking uh, viewers would know. So what do you think uh, the reason behind this is, the, uh, the, the reason behind putting uh, survival uh, at the forefront. Yes. Well, it's uh, connected to what I just said, actually. For example, back in 2002, when uh, AKP and President Erdogan uh, first came to power, actually the analysts were observing a fatigue in Turkish society. Actually, this fatigue was so high that they were even, the voters were even willing to get rid of all the existing political actors. And the, uh, the economic crisis was so deep at that time. And at that time, AKP came to power because the electorate thought that AKP and Erdogan were um, a new political actor coming up with a new uh, future perspective, a new utopia uh, that can provide them with a, uh, with a solution for the, for the fundamental problems of Turkish society and Turkish political life. And when we look today, today they don't have any more such a perspective. Today, the fundamental prob problems of Turkish society are still so high, and the current government doesn't have any more such a perspective. So the only remaining option for them is this survival issue. So they, um, it's not uh, surprising for me actually seeing them resort to this option because this is the only thing they can resort to, I think. Mm -hmm. And do you think it resonated uh, within, the, within the voter base, mm. the survival rhetoric? Well, I, I, don't, think as, uh, well, I don't think it did uh, as much as Erdogan expected. Actually, this is a strategy mainly um, of MHP, the traditional strategy of MHP. The nationalists um, were always doing their politics by by, um, um, by emphasizing on the fears about the survival of the nation. And this is what the current government is also doing, um, being just, just doing what their uh, ally in the uh, People's Alliance do, does. Actually, I don't think it resonated within the electorate so much as it did, for example, in June 24 elections. At that time, actually, the economic crisis was not so deep. And also, the opposition um, followed a strategy of polarization through the campaign of Muharrem Ince. And that's why maybe it could, it could have um, resonated within the electorate in June uh, 2018, and it did. But today, the economic crisis is so high, and for the electorate, within both blocks, both within the block of um, People Alliance of AKP and MHP, and within the block of opposition. The first problem is economy today, and that's why the survival issue is not something that uh, the people are very much um, uh, feeling familiar with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's start talking a bit about the opposition now, mm -hmm. after we're done with uh, the AKP's Base, as you know, Bekir Ardur from Conda Research was uh, was here in our studio recently this week, um, just day before days before the election, talking about how the results uh, may turn out. And one of the important points that he raised uh, was the fact that, well, this is his suggestion, his claim, um, that uh, the harsh and demeaning rhetoric pushed by President Erdogan in his campaign rallies have actually made the opposition bloc to uh, stick together even more and uh, resulted in them to become even more consolidated than uh, they were before the pre-election atmosphere. First of all, would you agree with this claim? And uh, secondly, I'd like to point out that I'm asking you this because as a Mediascope reporter, you've been going around several Turkish cities, you've been on the ground, you've reported live from the ground, so you've had, um, uh, you've found many chances, several chances to speak uh, both with the voters, opposition voters, as well as representatives from opposition parties. So were you able to gather enough um, observations to verify others' claims? 
Well, yes, I would agree with this claim, um, as per my observations on the ground, actually. Um, polarizing discourses, mainly used by President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and mainly applied by People Alliance of MHP and AKP, actually these um, discourses aimed at consolidating their base, their own base. But doing this actually could also consolidate the base of the rival bloc. And this is actually what, uh, this is actually the case. Um, and for, as for the uh, People Alliance, it's more difficult to get consolidated because of the repercussions of the economic uh, crisis. I mean, they observe even the, uh, uh, the voters of AKP and MHP, they also, they can also see that this crisis and all the repercussions of this crisis are the result of the government's policies and preferences, actually. So they are not as eager as to, uh, to vote for AKP and MHP once again in this election. So it's even more difficult for, for them to get consolidated through these discourses. But on the other hand, in the block of, within the bloc of opposition, it's easier for them to get consolidated with the, the polarizing discourses of Erdogan, uh, even if they had some frustration or disappointment after June 24 elections. Uh, and in, on the ground, I witnessed personally that many people that uh, were undecided or maybe that were unwilling uh, to, to go to the ballot box, they decided to do so after the polarizing discourses of Erdogan. Mm -hmm. So uh, moving on from that point, let's wrap up by um talking a bit about undecided and apathetic voters. Undecided voters, you've already um, shared your, just shared a number of your ob observations on them, but then we also have uh, the apathetic voters as a category, and there's a lot of talk going around uh, saying that most opposition voters, uh, well, let me reformulate the sentence this way. The, the latest elections, the June 24 parliamentary and presidential elections, created a sort of a sentiment of uh, disappointment within the opposition bloc, within the voters of the opposition bloc. And hence, they have become apathetic. There's a lot of talk uh, going around that uh, claims this. My question to you is how seriously do you think we should, uh, how seriously should we think about undecided and apathetic voters? Do they have the power to, um, create to uh, result in a dramatic change in the result of the vote, let's say? Well, actually, we don't need a dramatic change. The dramatic change is even the movement of 3% uh, of the electorate could change everything now uh, in Turkey. You know, the opposition could win in Istanbul and Ankara or other metropolitan municipalities throughout Turkey through only the change of uh, the movement of uh, 3 or 4% of electorate. So, we should take them seriously. We should uh, think that this can create a serious change uh, as, um, uh, as far as the results are concerned. But we, we should also make a distinction between the undecided voters and the apathetic voters. Um, the undecided voters are mainly uh, within the camp of the uh, ruling bloc, the uh, Jumur Ittifak, or People Alliance of AKP and MHP because of the economic repercussions, as I already said. Uh, and they are still undecided. As many public researchers say, the number, the proportion of undecided voters is higher than um, in all previous elections. Now, you know, we are uh, just three days away, and still the number of undecided people make it very difficult to predict the results uh, of the election. So they, they will have an effect. They will have an effect, but in what way? Well, we will figure, we figure it out in three days. As for the apathetic voters, they are mainly in the opposition camp, as you, realize, as you underlined. And this is because of the frustration after the, uh, the disappointment after the June 20, uh, 24 elections. But uh, people, um, in my opinion, it's, let me put it very simply, people forget about it. People forget about it. And it's now um, time for them to go to the ballot box, they think, as I observed it, because uh, pe uh, they see again 
just like in the 24, uh, June 24 elections, that the opposition has a shot at winning in certain critical uh, locations or uh, metropolitan provinces. And I think, um, well, it's also important because, you know, as I said, even, the mo even one vote is very important in some locations. So maybe, maybe some apathetic voters will have an effect, but what we should be sure about is that the number of apathetic voters decreased dramatically after the, uh, uh, the adoption of a polarizing strategy by President Erdogan. So, but yeah, we will figure it out mm -hmm. in three days. On that note, Edgar will uh, conclude. Thank you very okay. much for your comments and for joining us in the studio today. Uh, today we were joined by Edgar Shar, who talked about the political atmosphere in the country just days before uh, the elections, the March 31st local elections. And now we'll continue with our next news video. Main opposition, Republican People's Party, CHP leader Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, was in our studio yesterday for an exclusive interview only three days before the March 31st local elections. Turkey is heading to the elections in quite a different atmosphere. For the first time, the society is face to face with the costs imposed on them by a political power that has been in power for the past 17 years. A face off so severe is happening for the first time. To be sure, this brings about a different atmosphere, one that is heavy. Secondly, there is absolutely nothing being offered to the people as a solution to the ongoing economic crisis. Let me underline it. There is nothing being put forward. What is even more strange is this. As of the 21st century, as of the year 2019, the state of the Republic of Turkey has no development plan. I mean, even households have plans. You plan things in order to make ends meet. Your child goes to school. It comes with a cost. You buy a house. You buy a car. All of these things come with a cost. Even when you want to buy a refrigerator, you plan a budget. But at present, the state of the Republic of Turkey, despite its size, has no development plan. The last development plan has expired in 2018. We're now in 2019, and there is no development plan in sight. For this reason, I'll give the same description that I have in the past. We are currently riding a truck that is speeding downhill with failed brakes. Nobody knows where we're going or what we'll be crashing into and how this will all end. Our reporter Murat Utku was in Ankara's Haymana district yesterday where he reported from one of President Erdogan's final campaign rallies before Sunday's vote. Recep Tayyip Erdoğan continues organizing his party's rallies in different cities. When it comes to the metropolitan cities like Istanbul and Ankara, he even visits each and every neighborhood two days prior to the municipal elections. Medyascope covered those rallies beginning from Istanbul to the most eastern city one where the majority of the population is Kurdish. Generally, what he he has been emphasizing during these gatherings is the continuation of the country. Erdogan says Turkey is under threat coming from northern Syria, saying the Kurdish groups like YPG, PYD, as well as PKK in Turkey, attacking the integrity of the country. Likewise, his political ally Devlet Bahçeli, leader of the Nationalist Movement Party. The other aspect he continuously has been repeating is the economical situation, which is vulnerable, as the economists say, in crisis. Erdogan insists there are internal and external powers who want to devastate Turkish economy, whereas the dollar and euro currency is getting higher. During all these gatherings all around Turkey, the main issue, he, he and he, his allies just saying that they are somehow going to solve the problems after the elections. Murat Utku, Medyaskop, Ankara. 12 days after the Christchurch massacre, where 50 people were killed, Medyaskop hosted three distinguished writers from New Zealand for a special broadcast. Paul Cleave, Sophie Sires, and Kelly Joseph joined Ushin Elichin on Wednesday and shared their views following the horrible attack. That because, you know, I've been to a lot of places, I, I've travelled the world, you know, and everywhere you go, uh, people love New Zealand. They love New Zealanders, they want to come to New Zealand. You know, I always felt that if I was in any kind of trouble anywhere in the world, I could go, look, I'm from New Zealand and, and I'd be okay. I always had my, my passport to, 
to protect me. And then I felt, last Friday, I thought, you know, everything has changed for all of us. You know, you've got 50 people who have, who have just died in horrific circumstances and will never be the same. And um, there, was this, there was this moment where there was a... I mean, I can only speak for myself, but for myself, there was this moment of a, of a sense of shame that this had happened inside our country and where people are supposed to come and feel safe, you know, you should live there, feel safe, it's a, it's a safe country. And, and that got taken away, you know, it was like, this is, I, I felt bad, you know, I felt uh, shame. And then you see how our government reacted, you saw how our Prime Minister reacted and, and that started to, to reverse. You know, within the following morning, I, I, she came on the news and said that, uh, you know, our gun laws are going to change. You know, there was no, we're going to debate it, Hopefully the wall, she said, they're going to change, give us 10 days. You know, it took six. You know, that's insane. Yeah. You know, um, she did so much uh, for, for the community. You know, New Zealand were, were paying for the funerals. We had the morning prayer playing uh, through the day last, uh, last Sunday. And I think it, it helped. It's definitely the sense, again, I can only speak for myself, but that sense of shame just, just lifted. Feeling great feeling of shame as well, that somehow in our place this could happen. But... I think she's spoken really beautiful words, and I think she's spoken words that um, that we all feel that our people, our people have been hurt, and we don't we don't think that's okay. Expressing in terms of um, you know maybe some uh, racism and things like that, but I think the shooting was a wake up call for everyone, and I think um, I think in terms of just going forward, um, I think everyone is kind of in this together, you know, and um, Māori people have a, a saying um, here, waka eke noa, which means we're all in this together. So I think, um, you know, it doesn't really matter whether you're Māori, Muslim, you know, Pākehā, which is, you know, European, New Zealand descent, um, I think at this point it doesn't really matter what race or ethnicity you are. You know, we just we all need to work together so that this doesn't happen again. We're, you know. That's all from this week in Turkey. Thanks for tuning in and hope to see you again next Friday at five PM. Goodbye.